So really excited to be here this morning with Garrett. And so Garrett has a, a pretty fun and interesting background that we'll get into today. But my favorite question that I like to ask is, how did you become an entrepreneur? Where, where was that spark? So we'll kick it off with, okay. talk a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, so mine actually started in sixth grade. Uh, so any of y'all were in Atlanta and technology back in the late 90s, uh, voice over IP was like a big deal. Uh, and there was a VoIP conference. And my uncle at the time was the CEO of a company uh, called Lucent technologies, and so he invited me uh, to a VoIP conference, and I was, I guess, 12 at the time. Uh, and I don't know what it was about that, but that's what got me into technology, and then from then it was, okay, how do I get out of school as fast as possible and start working? Awesome. So what was your first, like, idea? What was your first side hustle? Or yeah, the first thing I wound up doing is, so after that conference, I realized the internet must be a big deal. Uh, I didn't have the foresight to start a company using the internet, but what I wound up doing was starting a services company uh, where we did outsourced MIS work. So network set up, printers, laptops, to small businesses. So, so did you go to Walmart and like, put a flyer up that said, hey, uh, call Garrett for? Luckily, like uh, my target market was pretty like, easy to attract, which was Buckhead families, um, I guess a starting point. And then most of those people owned businesses. Uh, and so I would start with the family, and I would set up their first ever router, and then, oh yeah, the, the dad or the mom runs a law firm, and they want to get the internet. Um, and so it just kind of scaled through that. So you're like a one-man geek squad. Yeah, effectively. Um, so by the end of, I guess, 11th grade, when I shut down the business, we had about 50 small businesses and maybe 200 homes that I was working for. So before school, working for two or three hours, and then after school, two or three hours. It was great. I've never made as much money per hour uh, since then. That's, that's okay. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. So you were doing it as a, a service business, and then at some point the idea clicked and you wanted to do a product business. What was your first product? Yeah, so uh, like I said, in 11th grade I got tired of services, which is if anyone's in professional services know the grind. And got introduced to a, a gentleman named Trip Rackley. And he had taken a company public and was working on his next venture called Firethorn. Uh, and I was, I guess, 17 at the time, 18. And he was like, all right, cool, you can run the network at my house. And that'll be your first job. And if any of you uh, know Trip, uh, that actually was a full-time job, uh, running that network. Uh, it's a, a lot of capacity. Uh, but that transitioned into an engineering role at Firethorn, then into marketing, then into sales account management, literally over the course of 24 months, uh, every three to six months, I'd walk in a trip office and say, what's the biggest problem that no one's working on? And he'd say, well, we just signed SunTrust as a customer. We don't have account management. Can you just do that for the next few months? And that's what I would do. And so I kind of got the fast course in entrepreneurship there, just because I touched everything but finance, which uh, is an important function in an organization, but is by no means the most important for the first few years of the company. That's awesome. Yeah. So how many years in um, Firethorn and subsequent ventures did you work for starting your own? And what were some of that thought process? That yeah, so I'm actually perhaps hold a counter point of view. I think some people push some kids that are in their early 20s to go start a company and just figure it out. Uh, and I think that's really bad advice. Um, it's just like a high risk with a lot of reward. I think there's a lot more value in attaching to a company, whether it's two years old, three years old, that has significant product market fit, and jumping in, and seeing how to pull it off, um, and learning first, and then doing it. So for me, after Firethorn, I watched this go from nothing to a successful exit. Uh, joined Qualcomm, solved that process, stuck around Qualcomm for two or three years, and then after Qualcomm, uh, started a company called Experience. Uh, and just, one, having a network of people to coke on a company with is critical. Uh, and then two, knowing a lot of the mistakes not to try to repeat. So you know, started with, okay, this is all the things we did wrong at Firethorn. Let's at least start not by not doing that. Uh, and so that was for me at least. So I was seven years in the startup world before I actually started. Awesome. So give us the elevator pitch for Firethorn, and then give us the elevator pitch for experience. So Firethorn didn't sound really dated. Uh, we started the company uh, before the Motorola Razor. 
so at the time, apps were not a thing. Even data was still, you're getting charged by the kilobyte or megabyte. And so the pitch then was pay with your phone, um, which is an app, so like probably everyone in this room uses Apple Pay or Google Pay or whatever product. Uh, so that was the original pitch. And so we had aggregated eight of the top 10 financial institutions into a single banking product. And you could pay your bills, pay your friends, and eventually you could use NFC to, to pay. Uh, after that, the pitch for experience was live events suck, and they shouldn't suck. So we all remember going to baseball games or basketball games with our parents, and it being this like, religious experience. And as a perhaps generation below that, it felt like that richness had disappeared. So my favorite example is I have two season tickets to George Tech football. And it's great, I support my alma mater. But who I go with changes on the service of When I take my wife, Megan, uh, all she cares about is a clean bathroom. And it doesn't matter where we sit, it doesn't matter what the food is like. If she has a clean bathroom, she's gonna have a good four hours. Uh, and so when I buy my season tickets, I prioritize that as a function. So I don't. I sit in some of the worst viewing angle seats in the stadium, uh, but we have a very clean bathrooms. Uh, and it sounds funny, but it's true. But when I take my brother, who actually likes football, he's like, man, I wish we were on the 50. I'm like, my tickets are more expensive than the tickets on the 50. So why can't I just be like, hey, Georgia Tech, like, I actually prefer two, two seats on the 50 this time. Uh, and then when I take my dad, he's like, oh, I'd love to have a beer while I watch the game. Okay, well, there's only certain places in the stadium you can buy beer. Uh, 50 on the west side is not the case. So what we built from a technology perspective was the ability for a fan to have complete control over their experience. So depending on who you're there with, why you're going, how much money you're willing to spend, we can control that flexibility. So in an ideal situation, an organization like the Orlando Magic, where they've got some flexibility on inventory. Uh, Is that code for having lots of empty seats? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's actually one of the things that we realized early on. We assumed that our best customers would be like, the most pent up demand, 99%. <coughs> like, 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 like a Duke basketball game with Cameron? Okay. Yes, as yeah. I'm told. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we find out like they don't care. So like, oh no, we're great. We don't need any help. Our fans love us. And then the teams at the bottom who are like at sixty percent occupancy are like, we just need to sell seats. Like we will do anything to get someone to stay. So we found that this like seventy-five to eighty-five percent occupancy was this sweet spot where they made enough money to care about making more money and wanted a better fan experience. So that's what's the most unusual fan experience item that was offered for sale while you were there? Uh, so perhaps the most like proudest product we built and also the most poorly adopted and eventually shut down. Uh, we had developed what we call a no-show seat. And so we built a system in collaboration with Georgia Tech that could predict with over 95% accuracy who was going to show up to the game and who wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we would sell those seats uh, as an upgrade, a uh, really steep discount. And then if that fan wound up showing, like we made a mistake, we would move even to a new seat, um, like immediately. So as soon as they scanned in, we'd be like, oh crap, they showed up, we didn't think they would. You need to move seats like right now. That fan is on the way to your seat. Uh, and so there were about a half a dozen teams that loved it because from a revenue perspective, they were making pure profit selling the same seat twice. Uh, but as if you fly often, you know the experience of being double booked uh, creates a pretty poor user experience. Uh, and so we wound up never being able to figure out like how do you make that work. But from a technology perspective, it's like, this is awesome. We know who's gonna show up. Now, my understanding is that there's other types of fun upgrades, like have the mascot come to your seat or get a picture with one of the famous players. Yeah. From those different types, was there one that was most popular or the category of that kind of thing that people really liked? Um, so probably the most expensive and the most exciting would be with the Seattle Seahawks for $20,000. You could be on the 50-yard line when the team runs out and they like release. I don't think Seahawks are actually it's a very large bird. They release it from the top of the stadium, and it lands on your arm. Uh, and you're like in the middle of an NFL game, like right on your arm. Now, is that, is that an in-app upgrade, like fill my credit card 20 grand, or you have to do that like in No, yeah, it's in-app, like 2.9% stripe fees. Like, uh, but that one was like what we found with most of our NFL type product offerings is it wasn't like, yeah, maybe you, but like for me, like I'm not gonna be able to wipe book, oh, let's go spend $20,000. Uh, it's almost always a like corporate event where someone was taking a client and like, oh, watch this. Like, and when they push that button, did it, you know, they says like, are you sure? Did it be like, are you really sure? And then it's like one more time, like, are you really, really sure? 
Uh, not in that case. One yeah, of the things that we just are you sure? Twenty grand. Twenty grand. You're over. So one of the things wow. that we did, what we did to try to not necessarily mitigate that is there was an access control. So if you were a season ticket holder of certain stature, like you would be the first one in. So you knew you only had a five minute window of like this is you're the only one in the store, and that would kind of go over time. So something like that might get offered for sale seven days in advance, um, but the general public would see it the day of. Well, that's crazy. That is, uh, that was a pretty good one. And then at, at George Tech football, since we're in Atlanta, uh, this one's pretty cool if anyone has kids. Uh, this is free, actually. Uh, you can have your son or daughter be the uh, kid who gets to flip the coin. Uh, wow. So that one's pretty cool. Uh, obviously, it's first come first serve. Yeah, it's first come first serve. Uh, but George Tech doesn't charge for anything. So that one's pretty cool. That's very cool. So experience ap after Firethorn. Mm -hmm. How many years at experience? And then what was the? Aha uh -huh moment to go to the next thing. Yeah, so we started experience. Uh, the LA Clippers were our first customer. We wound up growing that to about 80% market share before selling it to Cox. Um, at that point, uh, it had been three and a half, four years. Um, pretty tough run, a lot of travel. And spent the next two years uh, incubated Clutch, which I don't know if you all with Clutch, drive Clutch and used it. So we started that, got that going. Uh, and at that point, uh, I was ready for a break. And so I told my wife, like, I'm going to take a year off. Uh, it's going to be really helpful, it's be nice, like, just relax. Uh, and that was the plan. And that would have been December uh, 2017. Or no, sorry. It was a year ago. That no, was like two days ago. Uh, no, a year ago, about today. And uh, that was the goal. And only about three months in, I called Matt, who's my co founder of Clock. Hey, we should start messing around with stuff. I'm super cool. Um, there's nothing to do. And that was kind of the okay, we're ready to get back at it. That's awesome. So take us through the thought exercise, come up with Flock and other ideas that you evaluated with that whole experience. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun because Matt was uh, semi employed, I like to call him. Uh, he was working, but not that hard. Uh, and we looked at probably a dozen opportunities across music, uh, toilets, <laughs> which we always laugh about, uh, sports, again, uh, fitness. And we looked at everything, just whatever we were interested in. And this one came up around the clock. And unlike the rest of them, we had customers before we had anything even close to a product, close to a pitch. And that was really interesting to uh, me because it felt like there must be a lot of pent up to People are signing a contract without ever meeting us in person, without ever seeing a demo, without even really understanding what this is going to do. They're like, so you're going to help us be safer. And it's like, that's generally the pitch. And they're like, okay, here's $500 a month. It's like, hmm, we should really go build this product. It's like, we now have customers. So that's that was, awesome. That we hear was about you know, customer discovery and trying to unlock authentic demand. And so here's a case where you've actually got somebody to sign a contract, or at least a letter of intent. Oh, those are contracts. A contract with no yeah. product at all. Mm -hmm. No products. Wow. Yeah, it was like a little bit scary. Uh, yeah. Because we had no idea how long it would take to build this uh, hardware. And so we really rushed from that point on. Yeah. And it's been, that would have been end of March of 2017. So it was almost 12 months ago. And it's been just a whirlwind of activity since then. That's awesome. So going back to the ideation and thinking about toilets and yeah. security for the neighborhoods. Did you have a list, did you have a Google Doc, and you're just like, this is a 10 out of 10 and a 5 out of 10, or you just hashed it out until the gut said, go that way? What did you do? Yeah, so Matt and I both had preferred like, products to go work on. Uh, Matt wanted to do something in music. I wanted to do something in fitness. Uh, Matt doesn't like to work out. Uh, so that was almost a deal breaker from the start. Uh, and then music, while I do like music, there's no money. I've yet to see a company, maybe Spotify, actually successful in music. And so it wound up being that like of all the things that had a little bit of traction, this one was the only one where we both went like, okay, this makes sense. Uh, it's a market that is largely untapped. Right? So there's 400,000 neighborhoods across the US. No single entity has sold anything to neighborhoods as a collective buying force. And uh, there's proven models, whether you look at ADT or Nest or Ring now, that people pay for it's not like we're going to have to ever go up and be like, oh, this is something that 
you would think is going to be free. Um, so it was just there. So we just had those, and we had built prototypes for the other ones that were software based. And this was a more simple like, oh, it's hardware, like we'll figure this out eventually. Um, so that's kind of how we got it. So from an idea point of view, some people talk about, oh, you need to be really passionate about the idea. It needs to solve a personal problem. It sounds like this was something that was more of an intellectual exercise of like, hey, where's white space in the market? Where's an opportunity that we think is good, but you know, passionate about you know, fitness or music? This is one where it's like, okay, let's go after a market and less of a passion. Does anyone get excited about bill pay? I don't think I have one. Like, we, no one cared about banking when we did fire zone. We believe that there's a super pain point that we can solve. And if you go to experience, like, I hate sports. Uh, I've never watched ESPN. Like, I would make a fool of myself in front of customers because I'd ask the dumbest questions about sports. Uh, but when I saw consumers use our products, and I'd see that, like, one of my favorite stories is like a guy who just got home from Iraq. This was his first basketball game. He's a huge Clippers fan. His first game he's been to in years. And he's able to spend like 20, 30 bucks to get a better, better seat have a better experience with his daughter he hasn't seen in here it's like okay sports I don't care about but like that that emotional reaction I can get behind and so flock was the same way like I don't have a deep passion for neighborhoods or civic responsibility or even security but when we put someone who violated someone's you know space and broke into their home broke into their car and put that person in jail because it's where they belong that's a reaction that I can get behind because that woman uh, now feels safer because she knows our product is there. So I care less about the industry, I care less about the product, and I really just focus on what's the reaction that someone's going to have when they use the product or work from. Uh, because that's easier to sell. Uh, because most people here are probably like hate ADT or hate whatever their service provider is, and I agree, but you, the reaction you have by like having that is a peace of mind, and that's something you want. Yeah. So you and Matt decided to do Flock. What was the very first thing you did? decided, okay, this is the direction we're going. Well, Matt probably complained for the next two weeks about, like, why are we doing hardware? This is a really bad idea, uh, which I agree. I don't recommend hardware on anyone. Uh, it's a lot harder than just software. Uh, and the first thing is, like, well, we have two customers that expected a product. Uh, so we started just figuring out, like, how are we actually going to deliver on this product? So what we had realized in the industry is that the reason why most neighborhoods don't have a traditional security product is because nothing is affordable. And so while we were charging what we thought was a lot of money, compared to what their options were, we were still less than a tenth of a traditional price. Uh, and the reason why is because we were like, oh yeah, we don't need to run power anywhere. Like, oh, our cameras will be totally wireless. We had done zero power consumption, like, like tests. We were like, oh, figure that out. And they were like, oh, we'll read every single license plate down in your neighborhood and done zero research on like how to actually do license plate detection, which winds up being pretty difficult. Um, and so we just literally picked off, like, what's the most important thing? And went one by one. So the first thing was, like, we got to get a camera in the field. So we just, like, grabbed a um, box about, say, like, this big, probably. Yeah, like, this time, probably, like, this big. And a uh, waterproof box, and just, like, started drilling holes in it and putting parts that we could find off of the internet and just started plugging stuff together. Um, and so, like, we still have that first camera in our office it's crazy looking. It's like we were trying to figure out like well how much infrared do we need to capture a license plate at night? So we just got like holes everywhere with like infrared arrays. And you're like, all right, let's just try with three. And so we'd be there at eleven o'clock in that neighborhood, like waiting for a car to drive by. <laughs> and they'd be like, hey, did we get it? Like, oh nice, like that worked. Uh, and so for the first probably two months, we were in those neighborhoods every day. Uh, and that was really important because we just could figure out such a fast iteration cycle because every time a car drove by, it was an ability for us to figure out like, is the product doing what it's supposed to do? Uh, and that's pretty un unusual. Like the experience, we really only had users when there was a game and we had one customer, two customers, and they have one game a week. So just that like, iteration cycle was so slow. But in this case, it's like it's every minute. So I've never done hardware before, but it sounds like you would actually assemble off the shelf pieces mm -hmm. into something and then test it, and then over time, once it's like, okay, that's the direction we're going to go, then you would have that configuration outsourced yeah. to actually make it in a smaller, more self-contained package. Is that Yeah, so the general rule of thumb is like, unless you're putting silicon down and you're going to be like a true hard tech company, 
there's no value in like proving that your circuit looks good or that like your bomb is really low. Because even right now with the number of customers we have, like 10, 10 to fifty dollar change in our bill of materials just like doesn't really matter. I mean it's obviously you want to have good margins, but that matters when you have a thousand, two thousand, hundred thousand units. So the first year or two, you're just trying to figure out can you make this thing work? And so for us it was you know, we're going to buy infrared arrays off the shelf. We're going to buy image sensors off the shelf. We're going to buy, we're going to use a Raspberry Pi because that thing has most of what we need and it allows us to write code in Python. It's like, we don't need to do C yet. Like, we'll just have bigger batteries. So like, if we have, don't have enough power, we'll just get bigger and bigger batteries. Uh, and we have like huge batteries and stuff, just big lead acid batteries. Um, so the whole thought process is like, you don't want to build anything that's ready to build. And then as you figure out what's core to your product which is being successful, that's when you start bringing it out. So if you look at our product, we use LTE for transmitting data. We could go design our own cellular mode. And it's pretty doable. It'd probably, it'd probably take a month or two, and then probably six months of work with at and Verizon to get certified, and it costs like 10 bucks. Or we could spend $80 and get a unit off the shelf. Okay, I'll buy that unit off the shelf, plug it in, and now we're online. And now, if you forecast six months from now, yeah, we will probably go do that exercise because if we think about shipping 10,000 units, that's $70 difference in price, well, that's a $70,000 shipping on our margins. Okay, that matters. But today, it's like, how, what can you buy off of Alibaba? What can you buy off of Amazon? It just starts sticking them together. So, from a hardware point of view, from the first box you bought to assemble off the shelf components, to placing your order to have a nice looking device built somewhere overseas. How Still assembled in Georgia. Still assembled in Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? What was that timeline? Uh, what business point of view? Ten months. Ten months. Yeah. So like we just started doing our first runs of that product. You see online uh, in like January, and that's pretty fast. Um, January is the last month. Yeah. yeah. Last. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty quick. Um, we are fortunate in that, unlike a consumer electronic company where your first run might be 10 or 50 or 100,000 units, like at our pricing and our business model, if we do a run of 1,000 units, like we're doing a few million dollars in ARR. Um, and so we're able to just kind of like operate in a little bit of a weird place because we can afford to do final assembly in QA in Georgia. We can afford to get parts like shipped to us versus the traditional prototype in America, fly to China, stand up a manufacturer, and then fly home and cross your fingers that your Kickstarter goes well and that you're going to sell 10,000 units, mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty scary place to be. So the device today, what are the main components of the hardware today? Yeah, so if you look at what we do, it's wireless, right? So we have a big solar panel that's about this big, a big lithium ion battery. So 80% of the physical space inside of that camera is a battery similar to your iPad. Um, just really the top 20% is, uh, is the camera itself. And inside of the camera, you've got the image sensor. It's like we didn't build that from scratch. Like we use a Sony product. Uh, what we did build from scratch is the chip that sits on top of that. So like what makes our product unique is that it is very low power. So a car drives by, uh, that triggers a motion event on the device. It wakes up and starts taking pictures. But the actual Linux component that we're all of like our software engineers are in the firmware, that, which is a lot of power, sleeps until that kind of like smaller device wakes up uh, and fills up with memory. So there's really almost two cameras inside of the camera. There's this like very, very dumb device that just takes pictures when, when a hot object moves by. And then whenever that runs out of space, the smarter computer wakes up and says, like, oh, little guy, you took 200 pictures in the last 20 minutes. But hundred of those are trash because it was a squirrel or it's just like a false positive. So in Atlanta with asphalt, heat rises. That looks like motion from a heat perspective. So we delete those. Uh, we'll do kind of like a hot dog, hot or not type kind of analysis of like what do these pictures have interesting, that's interesting. So that's happening on like a Linux uh, system on a chip. And then eventually, once we've got it down to only the pictures that matter, we use the modem that's on board to then transmit that to the cloud. So if you look at it, it's like we've got a big infrared array, uh, that's for nighttime. Uh, we've got the image sensor, a big battery, uh, two computers, uh, solar panel, and then a nice little plastic enclosure. 
It's awesome. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's a more than meets the eye, but mm -hmm. but like like I said, of that range, the only part that's truly truly custom to us, where like we could find nothing close to something like off the shelf, is that little computer. So after the ten months of development, like the infrared array. I can tell you the part number, and if you're a semi-qualified electrical engineer, like you could redo that circuit tomorrow. Like it's not complicated. Same with the modem, same with the battery. All of our secret sauce is in that little computer, uh, and that's the only part that's like custom for us that we design. That's awesome. So you decided to build a hardware plus software company, and somewhere along the way you decided to apply to Y Combinator do an accelerator. Yeah, take us through that thinking and what that experience was like. So would 100% recommend everyone do it. Uh, I would do it again. Uh, so Matt and I looked at this opportunity and felt like it was big enough to do venture capital. So that was the first thing. He said, hey, what's our goal? Is our goal to get cash flow positive as fast as possible and just have like a nice business that grows maybe 30% year over year? Or do we want to go swing the business? And we felt, felt like this is a billion dollar plus opportunity uh, if we seize it fast enough. So we're going to go down the AC route. So I was like, decision one. OK. Do we think we can raise $50 million in a year? That was a good question, too. Because if you look at Ring, you look at Nest, you look at Boost, like look at any hardware company that reaches critical mass, you're going to raise somewhere between 30 to $50 million. Like, that's just almost inevitable. Um, and we said, probably not. Could we raise 15 in Atlanta? Or yes. Especially with SaaS, we've got the margin of 20, probably. But there weren't any hardware companies that raised a lot of So we said, okay, we have to raise money out west. Do we have a book of people we can call that go raise money? He said, Atlanta, we probably could. And we said, no. Okay, how do we get one? He said, well, why Comrade would be great? Yeah, it would be helpful from a hardware and software perspective just to have more advice. But the biggest thing was the rate of table was like just this network and credibility in the market that we had. Uh, so we applied, um, and then if you haven't read about it, it's pretty interesting. About 10,000 companies apply uh, twice a year. Uh, 500 of them get invited for an in-person interview. And the interview is five minutes long. Um, so you've got five minutes to convince three people, and all three have to say yes, uh, that you should be invited. So of the 500, 100 of them get invited to participate in the uh, So it was a pretty quick, it's a lot of flying for five minutes. That is. <laughs> yeah. But it paid off. It did. Yeah. And so you, you got accepted, you moved out for three months. Three months, yeah. And that was actually one of the most valuable things that I feel like uh, YC taught us was the importance of clarity in, in your product, especially early on. And so they, Y Combinator puts zero credibility and value in like big strategy, right? And so like five-year vision, I right? guess. Airbnb, like one of their favorite examples of talking about what their pitch was like during the accelerator part was like, it was still renting a spare bedroom. Like the idea of renting a whole house wasn't there. The idea of hotels like they're doing now wasn't there. Like none of that existed. It was just like, we just think people want to like stay on other people's couches. Uh, and it, it wasn't for years later that they developed this big vision they have now. So for YC, it's like, you should just be really clear what you do. Like if you can't explain it to your grandparents in less than ideally 20 words, it gets still too complicated. And so the majority of the time you're there, you're just focused on like, talking to your customers and talking, trying to figure out a way to talk to them in a capacity that, no matter what the age they are, they go like, oh, I get what you do. Uh, and then on the technology side, like ideally building something that works and actually delivers on that five or six word pitch. Uh, and so for us, like, it became like, we build security systems for neighborhoods that stop crime by using license plates. It's like, okay. I, I, get, I get enough to ask now, like, well, how do you do this? Oh, we have this wireless camera, and you can get into it. But for us, you know, our average customer is retired. Uh, she doesn't think about technology. She doesn't care about technology. She just needs better security in her community. And so we have to very slowly open up that onion of like, why our product is so, so much better. But she just wants to know, like, will you stop crime? Will you solve crime? Yeah. So demo day comes along and you raise some money. Yeah. How so much did you raise and what was that fundraising process like? Yeah, so it's a very different experience. Uh, 
Um, so there's 100 companies that present all across, or the same day roughly, and there's 500 investors in the room. And that ranges from uh, people like yourselves, uh, who are angels, uh, but then also the Sequoias and Greylocks and uh, those types of firms from all the room. And you've got three minutes to explain what you do and what kind of traction you have. Um, and then every single uh, investor has a, a clicker and they can say whether they like it or not. Uh, it's like voting on a game show. Uh, pretty much. Um, and then they've got some pretty nice software on the back end that does matchmaking. Uh, so I think we got two or three hundred likes. So for us, one of the things that we got, I want to say lucky, because it was complete luck, is although we had, we had seven customers at the time, so we had added a few, uh, we had a product that was working better, still barely working. Uh, but what was critical is like we solved our first crime two weeks before the event. And I can tell you of the like four or five slides I had that talked about like this is a massive market and look we've got revenue and all this stuff, like none of that matters. The only thing that matters is like look it works. Like if we can make this product work, if we can attain this market, like people will go to jail. And that people will pay for that. Uh, and so like one of the things that which was helpful for us to figure out, which we had thought about earlier, is like, what's the one thing about this business that's gonna make every investor go like, that's really interesting, because already is that real? Um, and so for us, we did the pitch. Uh, we met with probably five to six investors afterwards, uh, four of the six invested. Um, and so we wound up raising a few million dollars in a matter of about two, Two weeks, less than yeah, a week. Uh, so it's very abnormal. But for like YC, almost every company raises at least 500k, uh, and it's typically in you know one of two. It's a pretty. That's why I say like if you want to want to go raise money fast. YC is a good way to do it. You have to still do everything. Like you can't just be like, okay, great. Like there are plenty of companies that raise nothing and are not successful. Uh, but YC is so relentlessly focused on. You have to have growth. You have to talk to customers. You have to build your products. Like, if you're not talking to your customers, like I, I work with a few startups in town. And I'm like, the number one question I ask when I meet with founders is like, oh, well, how many customers are you talking to? Because if it's not like over a hundred, then you're early. It's like, you know, what did you do? Like, what were you doing in your entire month? Like, there's, that's the only thing. You should do. So we raised that money, uh, most of it from uh, traditional firms. Uh, and then moved back. Like, we were planning on staying out west for a few extra months, but we didn't know how long it was going to take. And Matt jumped on a plane, uh, and I got my dog, and we got in our car and drove to the We drove. Uh, we have to move back right away. That's great. So, raise some money, move back. What's the current state of the union for the business now, in terms of what you're working on, what are the big initiatives, that kind of stuff? Yeah, so since we got back, we've grown 30 to 50% month over month been uh, exciting but also exhausting. Um, we still continue to do that. If we look at our projections for the next 90 to 120 days, that growth should continue based on our pipeline. So number one, like we're going to build out a sales team um, in the next month or two. Uh, so if you know of any inside sales reps, people that want to close the business, uh, we are looking to meet those people. Uh, so right now, that's a big focal point. Uh, second focal point is working with police departments. Uh, so you should hopefully see in the next few weeks press release code goes out about uh, we're working on a pilot uh, with the Marietta Police Department, uh, with the LaGrange Police Department, and uh, Peachtree City, where we're going to donate cameras uh, to their organizations because they typically, a police department that size can't afford uh, something like the city of Atlanta has, where they might have 100 LPR cameras. Uh, but for Marietta, like, we can donate four, four to ten of them, uh, these mobile units, and they can actually do a lot of good. And obviously, from our perspective, it's good because the police are one of our most important customers. Uh, so at the end of the day, like, they need to use our cameras to solve crime. And if you run your HOA, uh, you're going to go to either Google or your local community affairs officer to figure out how you run the security neighborhood. And then on the engineering side, uh, we're tracking just over 200,000 cars a day now, uh, which is a lot of data. Um, and so we are continuing to invest in how do we make that search and discovery process better. So today you can go in and say, there was a red truck in the neighborhood in 
pretty sure that was the vehicle that, that did it. And if you're in one of our neighborhoods that has 10, 15 cameras, that's 200 hours of footage you're gonna have to go search through. Well, with our product now, you literally just say, like, I'm looking for red trucks today. And we'll say, like, here are the three red trucks that were in the neighborhood today. Here's how often they've been here in the last 30 days. And here's their license plate. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty big. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <coughs> even if we're only 80 or 90% accurate, but we're soft on that filter, it, we remove so much noise. Like, get rid of trucks, get rid of sedans, like, just focus on this one type of car that we're looking for. So that's a pretty, that's pretty cool. So you mentioned that last month you placed an order for the device we see <coughs> on the screen here. How many units approximately, and what's the lead time, and what is that like getting something where, in the software world, you make a mistake, you just go fix it. Here you're talking about hardware, you go place an order for many thousands of dollars and something's wrong, you got bigger implications. Yeah, so one of the areas that we are weakest in as a company is supply chain. Um, it's our first time doing this for everyone in the company. And so I don't know if any of y'all follow like, Chinese holidays, but like, it was just recently the Chinese New Year. And so like, all of our suppliers have been offline from last month. And it's not like American style vacation, where it's like, kind of working, kind of not. It's like, those people go dark. And for a, month. for a full month. Wow. Uh, which is something, something to be said about like, huh, they, that country works very hard nonstop, but then like February, it's a very serious, serious time off. Uh, so they're, they're back online now. Um, and the nice thing is, with our product, each of our different vendors has different order quantities and lead times. So we've got 500 solar panels uh, you know, on the way, and we've got 1,000 plastic enclosures. And those parts are actually pretty cheap. The most expensive parts, like the modem, uh, the actual circuit board, uh, we can order much smaller quantities. So while we have a six to 12 week lead time on some of the bigger, more commodity products, for the higher end ones, we might only have a four week lead time. We can order 50 or 100 at some point. So there was an element that if you ordered 500 solar panels and you know, the circuit board was wrong, you couldn't go back and still use those solar panels, but get the circuit board fixed and then reassemble and yeah, that, that's some exactly. all or not. And that's the benefit of using off-the-shelf components versus also feeling like you have to design everything yourself. Like we're not trying to reinvent solar panels. Yeah. Like I just need a black, cheap, 30-watt solar panel. And so we're going to source one from China, develop a relationship with someone. We went over there and met everyone in person. Which is like, if you're going to do hardware, you just have you have to go in person. Uh, there's just no choice. You don't have to go like tomorrow, but it should be in your plans that like you're going to go to China for some place in order because you want to value those personal relationships. So the solar panels, the cases, like that kind of stuff, that's not going to change, we can order large quantities, but the circuits, the camera sensor, that kind of stuff, we can order you know, really a month or two worth of inventory at a time, which is good for cash flow. That's awesome. So big picture, three to five, seven years from now, what is what is block safety to come? So in an ideal world, there's 400,000 neighborhoods, can't assume perfect adoption, but let's assume most of the market. Uh, the way we look at it is you know, we'd love to have 50 to 60,000 units deployed which puts us on almost every single street corner uh, in America. Now, our focus point is not Chicago, it's not downtown, midtown, Buckhead, Atlanta, it's suburbia. Uh, so we look at that and we want to have every single street put our product on it. The reason why is we believe in five years from now it's inevitable that our country looks like the UK, it looks like China from a surveillance perspective, which means cameras are coming. Like most everyone in this room probably has one camera at home, whether it's a Nest or a Ring or Amazon P, you pick it, they're so cheap now. We believe the same thing's gonna happen uh, in our public spaces, and there's just a question of whether or not that's gonna be launched by our government or by private organizations. Uh, we believe, from a privacy perspective, your own community should own that. Um, so our big push right now to, to neighborhoods is like, trust us, you're gonna to wanna to own this data. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to own the rights for how this is used and when this is used. Uh, and so if we pass forward and we're able to do that, you know, you're talking I do well, uh, two, three, four hundred million dollar ARR our business would be really great. That'd be pretty awesome. Yeah, I think it'd be good. Yeah. All right, so let's open up for uh, questions. <laughs> questions for Gary. Who wants to go first? Come on, Lance, you got a question. No? <laughs> no? <laughs> no? How do you get the data there? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the big thing we're focused on right now is, you know, we'll do 100 to 150 inbound leads a month. Uh, people that just like, are looking for a product like ours and when the only thing that exists. 
That's amazing. 13 months after starting. Yeah, it's great. 100 inbounds a month. That's really yeah, it's awesome. really good. Um, we're trying to figure out like how do we make that a thousand? Uh, because we believe every neighborhood can afford this product and every neighborhood needs this product. But every neighborhood isn't aware that they can go to Google and they can search neighborhood camera and we're right there. Or they can go to their local police officer and say, like, hey, what am I supposed to do to better protect my community? And if we do a better job of police outreach, they will then say, oh, we'll have to go to the clock. Uh, we can't push that product on you, but we should really look into that. So the big focus is, like, how do we take this pent up demand, continue to take advantage of it, but how do we build another demand? It's like what we are seeing that's really positive is density effect. So we don't have necessarily a network effect. The more customers we have, yes, the better our product is, but it's not like we get more invincible. But you get second order revenue and referrals. And, but, and that's what we're trying to figure out right now, which is like we just signed our first customer in Oklahoma. Uh, and then like that was last week. And this week we got six new leads in Oklahoma. And we're like, wow, how did you find this? Like, oh, we talked to Marty. I'm like, Marty's not even live. Like, he doesn't have our product. Like, okay, how do we take that and how do we make that happen 10 times over? Because clearly something went right in that sales process. Or maybe Marty's just special, but it's like, okay, well, how do we find more Marty's? Because Marty seems to be evangelizing for us, and he doesn't even have a product in his hands. And we found that a few times over, whether it's in, we've got a great customer up in Alpharetta, and he pushes hard for us, and we don't have like a referral program, it's not their money, it's more B2B in that regard. So for us, it's like, okay, take the organic that's happening, Multiply that by driving word of mouth and kind of sort of create demand in, in markets where there's other not taking crime or some other activity that we can take advantage of. That's awesome. Next question. I have a microphone too. All right, Hubert. Uh, you want to use the mic? What does your average customer conversation sound like, and what are the common, uh, I guess, if there's any objections <laughs> to what you're doing, and then what kind of contracts are you doing? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting customer. Um, as like I mentioned, they're typically retired, uh, have a wide variety of backgrounds. So we've got customers out for engineers, customers out for salespeople, customers out for lawyers. Uh, they all tend to not believe like what we're doing is possible. Because um, they've been told like solar isn't an effective use with a camera. It's like, well, that's because you were talking to people that only sell uh, powered cameras. Um, or they'll say, hey, it's too expensive for us. They'll ask about privacy. It's like we have a really cool feature uh, for our neighborhoods that if you have concerns about privacy, you can have everyone in the neighborhood register their vehicle. And then if neighborhood residents want, we can remove those vehicles from footage. Um, so like every neighborhood asks about privacy, we've never lost a deal because of it. Um, so we think we do a better job in the market handling privacy properly. Um, and then generally we charge per camera. Um, so it's a two-year contract uh, paid on the front end. That's the, that's the general. I mean, generally speaking, we'll talk to a customer at most two times, on average 15 to 18 minutes on the phone. Um, but then we'll have plenty of deals that'll go through. And like we just had a, a customer that's going live next week in Richmond, California, and they were talking to their account manager. And like, this is the first time I ever talked to anyone in your company on the phone. This is great. And I'm just like, oh wow, like that camera, that deal went all the way through just over email. Great, great conversation. One, uh, one question is how, as the entrepreneur, do you balance the upcoming raise, assuming you, you do that, right? I mean, how do, you, how do you plan for that? Is it six months in advance? Are you developing those, those relationships now through existing ex investors? What are, what, are you, what are your steps for future fundraising? Um, yeah, so we're fortunate in that uh, of our current investors, uh, two of them are in a position to deploy like, some material amount of additional capital. Um, the other ones are like strictly seed type investors. They'll carry through additional rounds, but they're not going to write a $10 million or $15 million check. Uh, the other two that are, if we have a good rapport with them, and so every other month we're testing the water, just saying, like, hey, here's where we're at. What, how's this look to you? Because, like, on one hand, in the ideal world, at some point they go, like, oh, actually, like, here's a term sheet. <laughs> which is the best case scenario. Um, but we can get critical, I can get critical feedback on the business from a financing perspective, which is, hey, you know, there was actually, if I'm going to call the news, Reem was just acquired yesterday. That's really good for us uh, because there was a lot of questions about whether or not Reem was going to 
pulled off. Um, Nest did really well. Pre-acquisition, Nest has really struggled in product development. So we've been following the kind of camera, hardware, this kind of space, and it's like, man, if Ring doesn't hit a home run, we're going to be in trouble. Um, even though we're a totally different market server, it's like people just look at it and go, like, hardware cameras, you're going to fail. Um, and then as it relates to the, the actual fundraise, so we're in a unique position because one, we're in Atlanta, which is a ding, and then two, we're a hardware company, which is a ding. Uh, so we're coming up with like two strikes when we show up. So our numbers have to be twice as good as everyone else. Our margins have to be twice as good. Our team has to be half the size. Our burn has to be half. So when we look at running the business, we just hold ourselves to an entirely different standard. And uh, YC has like a good saying, which is like, if you want to raise a Series A or Series B and be successful, it's not good enough just to have the best product. Like you have to be in the top one percent in every single part of your business. Um, and if you're comparing yourself to the company that's next to you, uh, that's like the worst thing you can do for yourself. Uh, like you have to compare yourself to be best in class across every single function. Uh, so that's kind of how we think about it. It's like how do we just grow as fast as possible? Uh, awesome. Next question. Yeah, I'm in my phone. So basically, uh, you guys had two uh, customers before you had a viable product, right? So what collateral did you use when you were pitching these customers? Phone calls. So uh, we found, so I cold, cold emailed 10, 10 people. Uh, probably, I'd say like three or four responded to my cold email. Uh, two of them were willing to get on the phone, and both of them became customers. So like, generally speaking, I do believe in like, you should have two co-founders. Uh, and one should be 100% focused on sales, and one should be 100% focused on product. And anything other than that, like, you're just, it's going to be really hard. There's clearly a lot of success stories uh, that go counter to that, but in our experience, it's like you know, that was really important. Right now. So we just, just talked to them on the phone, and that's it. We didn't have a website or anything. Did you ever want to like email 100 HOA people to see if like the numbers extrapolated out as you would bigger audiences? So two out of ten was good enough. Uh, well, I mean, it's contracts, so it's good enough. But the the thing that's different about our market is unlike if you're selling to pizza shops, like you can go on and buy a list of pizza shops. Uh, there is no database of HOAs. Most HOAs and neighborhoods don't have websites. They don't have email addresses. They might have a PO box. Um, so we did look into things like direct mail. Um, we did look into doing outbound. Uh, but what we found is that we ran one outbound <coughs> test early on, and like our bounce rates were so high that it just did, like we would pay people on Upwork to go s search for websites to get an email address, and our bounce rate was like 30 or 40 percent. It's like this is just this is never going to work. Like outbound might happen at some point, but we just needed enough to prove to ourselves that this would five. How'd you go the police department route? What was the process there? So we just, so on the one hand, we got inbound again. Uh, so we got a few police departments reach out and say, hey, can we buy your product? Like, oh, no, it's not, it's not really our business. I can sell exclusive media neighborhoods. Um, and what we found is, is we were sitting back and thinking through the customer journey of like, how do they, how do, why do people want our product? And how do they find it? We realized that there's only really three sources, or well, I guess four sources. They've got Google. We are doing really well there, and we spend a lot of time and energy making sure we do well there. We've got their property manager, if they have one, friends, and then the police. Um, so what we found is we went to, I'd say probably 100, 150 of these meetings in person, and you look around the room, and every single time there's a police officer there. And it's like, okay, well, how do we stop going to these meetings? We've got, to get, we've got to get this guy to start selling for us, because they're, it's his job to be here, and he's going to go to take somewhere like John's Creek. Uh, Officer Lieber goes to, I think, 150 of those meetings a year. Wow. Okay, so like, I need him to love our products, and him, or when someone says, like, we need to look into neighborhood security, he goes, I heard a lot. And so that was kind of the thought process behind the police, which is more of like a natural evolution. How do we stop going into meetings? Because like, tomorrow night we're double bumped. So we gotta figure out how we're gonna get from Buckhead to Mableton in 20 minutes, which that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Luckily, it's at 8 o'clock, so I have a chance. And so, community affairs is the type of type of, <coughs> this type of police officer that goes to these HOA meetings? Yeah, so almost every single police department in the country, whether they have 20 sworn officers or 2,000, is going to have one person whose full time job is community affairs. 
that's running programs like the Ride Alongs, that's running programs like high school outreach, and then go into these neighborhood meetings. Uh, on a smaller police department, uh, like the LaGrange, where I think they've got 40 or 50 sworn officers, the, the chief of police is going to be a lot more engaged compared to Atlanta, where they've got 2,000. Like the chief is looking at a global perspective of like, where are the hot spots and how do I reduce those? Awesome. Question? Yeah. You talked about um, talking to 100 customers a month, and if you're not doing that, you're like too early. Can you just kind of expand on you in that process and uh, and yeah, like where you find 100 customers? And, and what? It, and, and maybe I also struggle to know like what is your question process to like make that conversation with those 100 customers most valuable? Yeah, so I'll go back to experience as a starting point because like we're lucky at Flock because there's 400,000 neighborhoods. So it's like we can say some dumb stuff, we can make a lot of mistakes, it's not really going to matter because like there's so many neighborhoods. At experience, when we started the company and looking at sports, like there's only 300 deals that matter. Like that's it. Like there's 300 deals. And if you don't have most of them, like you're probably not going to be very good business. And so we were a lot more concerned with like, how do we go to market and do the customer discovery process, but not also ruin our chances of closing? Like, what is potentially the only deal? And so what, what I found to work really effectively is just to be really upfront that you're not selling. And just being like, look, I know nothing about your industry. I know nothing about your job. All I want to do is like understand what pain points you have. Because I have some ideas, but I'm just a technology person. And so like when we went into sports, we could get into like, Great example, like we got the CMO of the Celtics in one of our first meetings on a cold email because we were like, hey, we're two technology guys. Uh, we really think there's some opportunity to, to both increase your revenue and increase your fan experience. Like, we'd love to take 20 minutes of your time. And like, we would always keep it really short because inevitably, if the meeting's going well, the person's in it. Our average meeting would be like 90 minutes because we could see like the buyer, potential buyer, was super engaged. It's like those are the two things they care about. And so we would just have a list of questions. How big's your budget? Like, this is some brass facts because we legitimately had no idea what we were talking about. And then we'd show them our product or our demo at that point and could gauge feedback. And what we found is before we leave, we'd ask them, like, hey, are there any other you know, people in your industry that you think would find this conversation like fun? They'd have a good time. And we were fortunate in that industry that it is a very you know, like, tight knit community. And so Celtics got us to the Dodgers. Dodgers got us to the Clippers, Clippers got us to the Galaxy. Within two or three months, we had talked to 40 or 50. Of the 300 pool, like we had actually hit a large enough base to be like, we're not going to MLS, we're not going to MLB, we're not going to NFL, our target market has to be the NBA, it needs to be, like, we had built this customer profile in pretty good time, like before the product was ready. Uh, and in a similar fashion in Flock, it was just like, I'll talk to anyone. Like, you can't be, I guess like picky about who's willing to pick up the phone um, because you never know who's going to be like your most vocal customer. We'll have customers now who all talk to me for an hour and I'm like, I don't think she got it. Like, I, I don't know how this works. And then like a month later, she signed a contract and you're like, this is incredible. Like, what the heck? Well, how did this work? So for me, that's that's been like just leading with, I don't want to sell you anything. Because you're probably not ready. Like, if you're having this conversation, you're probably not ready to sell. So to get front. All right, last question. No, you hold it. Oh, oh, you go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so you talked about um, telling the customers how important it was for them to own this data. This is the data you're going to want to have. How far in the process were you when you came up with the T's and C's around ownership, access, and rights? You know, figuring out what you wanted to do with it and how much you needed to possess versus they did. And did you have to go back and catch up and get people to sign things? So just ownership and custodianship of the data. Uh, sounds like a lawyer question. I know it does. Uh, so I would say our, our T's and C's by aren't as bulletproof as they should be even today because you're always behind on your legal work. Um, that being said, it was almost from day zero that we had this belief that as a, like, a resident in my, so I live in Peachtree Heights and I walk my dog on every single day. And like I just, I never liked the idea that, like, even though I trust the police, that like they could just be watching me watch my dog. So that just doesn't. If I'm on Peachtree, sure, but like, there's, I'm on Winslow, I'm at Duck Pond, like, there's no reason for you to be watching me right now. Um, so we knew that from the get-go. We knew that 
as we roll out products where it makes sense for neighborhoods to collaborate with their data, we can just ask them and they'll probably say yes. It's like, we haven't had the situation yet, but we have a few customers that are really close together. And if there's a crime, I would bet that if we emailed that person saying like, hey, we'd, we'd really, it'd be really helpful if we could access your footage, please could access your footage too, because they're trying to figure out, was this car casing other neighborhoods? Like, why would they not say yes? Um, and then the only other thing on the privacy side is it's been a move on the access, it's been a moving target. So at first it was like, hey, only one person can have access to the footage. And then our customers were like, well, I'm a security chair, and that sounds like a lot of work. Uh, like I'm really excited about buying your product, but like I don't want more work. And so we just over the last probably six months have continually iterated on okay, how do we protect people's privacy, but also enable like a more seamless process. And so today the way it works is um, if your home is broken into and you have our product in your neighborhood, you will have never had access to the product. But once your home is broken into, you submit a police report, you get a one-time link that will give you 24 hours of access to go pull what you need. That same technology can be used with police departments, with police, with anyone. So we found that actually wound up being in a kind of like perfect world. So some of our neighborhoods, no one has access, access to the footage until a police report's been filed. Some have a single point of contact, some have a good group, um, but almost everyone uses that kind of like, okay, I need to go in right now for 24 hours. Awesome, let's give Garrett a round of applause.